Alright, and it appears we are live. What's up, everybody? It's G Mr. Drew here to welcome you to another episode of the Andrew Wolchewski Experience. This is going to be episode 184. Uh, I've been looking at this piece that I worked on in the last stream, and I feel like it's incomplete. <clears throat> Something about doing those late night, <clears throat> those late night streams, and my ability to uh, actually do art that I like. Or that I should even, you know, I don't know, consider as finished, I, I guess, is uh, it's a bit hindered. But I'm, I'm guessing the more I do it, the better I'll get at it. So, for now, um, what I want to do is work on this one a little bit more. It was a little, I didn't anticipate this, but looking at uh, what I wanted, you know, my original reference and looking at this, I'm not really feeling it. So I'm going to uh, continue working on it and then maybe start the next one because I, I did have the next one queued up to work on, but not going to do that just yet. Not until I can say I'm happy with this one. So I'm going to uh, jump on it for a little bit. It's mainly with the jacket. Um, the jacket is just a little too light, a little too blue. I'm just going to darken it up, add more color to it and make it a little more greener so it has a more aqua color and less of a blue color. That's all. A little more indigo, I guess. So yeah, I'm going to do that. And I, I'm i actually re-listening to a series that I listened to maybe a year ago. This guy, uh, he did a complete story of Final Fantasy VII Remake. And it was a five-part series. All, all the videos are like an hour long, give or take. So, you know, it's five hours worth of content all talking about Final Fantasy VII Remake and everything like that. Now, if you've kept up with that, then you you know you, you know all the theories about like the 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 multi universe whatever 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 thing that the the remake is doing. And this guy just goes in depth about that stuff. But I don't know. I just felt like doing it. I guess because Integrate came out, he dropped a couple videos recently. And I wonder if I want to listen to those or. But I just went back and listened to the five part series again, just because it's really good. And I'm enjoying it again. I'm already like pretty much done with the first video. And you know, so it's gonna jump into the second one. But again, it's all Final Fantasy VII stuff. Uh so yeah, I'm gonna let that rock in the background while I fix this jacket. Alright, let's do it. And Genova, and again it have been children with Sephiroth and Cloud. All of these clashes against good and evil are from the fate of the world. What is important to remember is that at the end of all of these battles, the world balances itself out to compensate for the other. But there are other meanings to pull from this, wings of light and wings of dark. Why does that sound familiar? Well, these are obviously the wings represented in the characters in Crisis World. The black wings are those who are born of dark, Genesis and Sephiroth. Note that Genova herself has wing-like pieces attached to her back, and the white wings being born from Cetra cells, Ariel being genetically born from the Cetra. Notable that Minerva also shares this association. Perfect. This isn't the only parallel that Final Fantasy VII makes to these colors. This is depicted through the white materia, the ultimate healing magic, and the black materia, the strongest magic used for destruction. This is also noted in the short stories. So I'll probably have to green it up a bit and then blue it out again because it's very blue at the moment. Then I'll probably have to throw some white highlight back in on top of it. supposed to fucking murder everyone in order to return them to the planet. And Omega, as the vessel for the Earth's entire life stream, with the sole purpose of carrying it to safety into the cosmos. It's good to note that these characters also have these wings to match their connections to their function in the balance. No, just before we get to the other part of Loveless, that all of these events and all of these depictions are repeating throughout time. I think one of these elements that we can see is actually in Safer Sephiroth and Genova, where in Safer Sephiroth, Looked like this at the end of Final Fantasy VII. I am pretty sure that Genova also was represented in this way before we see her in the events of Final Fantasy VII. But I'm going to be talking about that in the part two of this video. Three friends are depicted in the poem as told by Genesis. Another interesting aspect of Loveless is that Genesis mentions three friends. This archetype also has a presence throughout time in the compilation. It's understood by Genesis in Crisis Core that the three friends represented in the story are himself, and Gil, and Sephiroth. We can easily do the same thing for the second installment in the timeline, being Final Fantasy VII. 
And yes, there's three teammate slots in your party, and if after children, there are three remnants of Sephiroth. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, two of those groups are bad guys, but that's actually kind of the point. Time fluctuates back and forth, as described in Advent Children by Rufus. Genesis, Sephiroth, and Ariel all turn out to be villains to the story. The second group turns out to be good, because you defeat Sephiroth and save the planet. And then in Advent Children, it fluctuates back to villainous with Kadaj, Laz, and Yazoo. I hate that name. That's the only reason I've been calling them the boys. In remake, this is <laughs> Yazoo. <laughs> the three friends depicted in the story are also depicted as avatars by the three whispers summoned by the Harbinger. I know that there's a lot of people who suggest that these three are Kadaj and friends. I think that that has the strongest bearings just because of their weapons. For this discussion, they are just meant to represent the three friend avatars, perhaps a collection of the heroes that represented these roles. Maybe they are the first to represent them, or the last. Who, who knows? To add some fuel to the fire, we see Gadaj summon Bahamut in Add the Children. But this is something that we have seen Genesis do in Crisis Core as well, and your party does the same. This evidence suggests that Loveless has something to do with the cycle of time that the life stream creates. This is also subtly implied through the fact that Loveless has been adapted several times since its creation. We have the poem and the play, the same story being told throughout time. It's also noted that there are specific roles that the friends play in the story. The hero, the slave, and the traveler. The archetype of the hero can be seen pretty clearly in Cloud. Cloud being the living legacy of Zack. And I don't think it's too far of a jump to make that Minerva's legacy is Aerith. The fact that they are so similar and are depicted in the same ways, almost identically, is proof enough to fit the archetype. The archetype of the traveler and the hero. In Kadarj being this way, being notably the legacy of Sephiroth, Zack in Crisis Core being the hero, and Genesis being the slave, as noted by Genesis, and Angel being the traveler, and also being associated with the Cetra. The fifth chapter is missing from Loveless. This is actually the most intriguing element to me because the final act of Loveless is actually missing. Genesis creates his own rendition of the ending, and I get that this is used as a way of giving his character some closure, but knowing his fate at the end of the game, I don't think that there's much truth to it. But I think we're supposed to be left wondering about what the last page was meant to say, and even more now for a couple of reasons. I don't think that it's a coincidence that there are five acts of Loveless, and that recently Nomura announced that Final Fantasy VII Remake was the fifth and final installment of the series, especially because of the future of Remake seems so uncertain, and to have this page from the book that seemingly connects itself in more ways than one to the compilation, having this ending purposefully removed is really a puzzling thing. And then there was this line in the Remake about the play Loveless, the ending is different. This could be alluding to the fact that the Genesis ending is not the way the story ends, but the way that the story is meant to be told, and that the true ending of Loveless has some deeper significance. I know that this is also supposed to allude to the end of Remake and how it's so different, and it's a very meta moment, but because of how densely layered Remake is with its dialogue, it's not hard to think that this could easily mean more than just the one reference. What comes from all of this? Is there any more meaning to derive from Loveless and all of its acts? We talked about Sephiroth's intentions and that his destiny is freed from the live stream. We talked about the balance that our party has just shattered and that all of the details contribute directly to the repercussion of our actions in the remake. The Cetra's intentions of balance show us that their intentions are only for the planet. That seems like a very shimmer thing to do and maybe there is more of a connection to them and how that is directly linked to before crisis. What about Rufus? He did not agitate the timeline in any way, or come into contact with Aerith. What are the implications of this? We know about his father, but what about his mother? We know that Minerva is out there, and her Cetra heritage seemingly connects to the Book of Loveless, and she has direct ties to Aerith in many ways. Will she reappear in Remake? There is a goddess in the Book of Loveless. If Minerva is not the goddess, who is? What is the purpose of the representation of only one wing? on Genesis.
Genesis, Sephiroth, and Angeal. I didn't even talk about Genesis. What was his fate? And does he have a part in the remake? All of these questions will be answered in a part two of the video. And <laughs> I didn't even get to uh, explain how much Aerith knows. Uh, I guess that means we'll answer that in... <laughs> I think that's the end of this video. Did I give this guy a shout out with uh, what his channel's called? Sleep Easy. Sleep Easy I. All one word. Sleep Easy. That way at least... It is the exact opposite. What I'm going to be discussing here is a continuation of the previous video which continues a complete deconstruction of the entire compilation as it pertains to Final Fantasy VII Remake. Do you think that after the first part there isn't anything left to discuss? Uh, well, Remake as a whole encompasses every methodical collection of all the ideas, all the lore, and pretty much everything that Final Fantasy VII has been, which means that the potential for Remake and what it could be is enormous. From all of its stories, even outside of what we know of the compilation, Final Fantasy VII Remake uses all of that information to tell us the entire story, the way that it was meant to be told. A love letter, if you will. After continuing my research on theories built upon from the first video, I have looked through not only the entire compilation again, but I have extensively researched the original game and the other novels that were depicted as having direct relevance to Remake, i.e. the maiden who travels the planet and the boys are alright. All of the research shows us exactly what has been going on this entire time since the very beginning. I will do my best as I did before and give as much context as possible. From this point forward, whether or not this is the last video I make on this subject or not, which which it looks like it isn't, these videos will be going into extreme detail, and I mean a lot of detail. All of these details need context in order to get not only the big picture of Final Fantasy VII and Remake, but the right picture. But all of that pertains to what Remake will be doing. I do recommend that you have at least played Final Fantasy VII Remake and have watched the first part of this video. Without further ado, the theory. What if I told you that the Whispers had been a part of the compilation and alluded to from the very beginning? What if I told you that all the events of Final Fantasy VII have been destined to repeat themselves, and that this concept has been a part of the game since the original Final Fantasy VII, and that the battle of good and evil was destined to repeat itself from the very beginning? What if I said that the balance of good and evil was not only dictated by the planet itself, but by the Cetra and the humans as well, and that they together have perpetuated a cycle that has laid out tragedy upon tragedy? And because of this, the Cetra, Shinra, Avalanche, are actually all in service of the same goal, all willing to sacrifice innocent lives to reach their goal, no matter how righteous the goal may be, and to the balance of Gaia, their goals are all actually one and the same, and that Shinra and the Cetra are directly linked through their connection between one thing, flowers, and that these two groups functioning together has created the path of almost every single character in Final Fantasy VII and that their duties are to perpetuate the same conflict that is needed in order to keep the balance in the universe, and that the choices that our characters have made are in fact an illusion dictated by outside forces in order to arrive at this specific goal. And the god depicted in Loveless is the thing that is the source of all of this, the cycle of good versus evil, and that the goddess depicted in Loveless is in fact Genova, but as we'll come to find out, Genova is only part of perhaps something much more powerful. What if I told you that Aerith is not the last remaining Cetra? What if I told you that Minerva, one of the most powerful characters we have ever seen, has chosen Genesis to bring her one of the most powerful materia in history of Final Fantasy VII, the first materia? In all, Final Fantasy VII in its entirety is about the choices we make with the power that we have, and that Remake is about something much greater. Regardless of good and evil, you can make the right choice, but how far do you have to go to make this choice, this dream, a reality? Sephiroth, with the power that he possessed, has seized control over his destiny. And as we know from the events of Remake, Aerith was the tool for him to achieve this goal. But the truth is, is that Aerith, regardless of whether she was aware of Sephiroth's plan or not, has made
made a decision as well. Using the same power, she chose to defy her destiny, not only for herself, but for the rest of the party as well. But her decision comes at a very large cost, larger than anything that we have seen. The basics. So in order to understand the big picture of Final Fantasy VII Remake and its story, and where it's going, we are going to have to understand exactly how Gaia, Time, and the Livestream work. Not only in the context of Final Fantasy VII Remake, but the entire story of Final Fantasy VII as we know it. This will give us a very accurate reading as to how this all applies to what we can expect from future titles. We're going to be talking about these subjects I'm bringing up in this section in greater detail throughout the video, but I am going to spell them out now so that we can start to understand them better as we move forward. The Whispers. I can understand people not being super... Already a ton better. It. it adds a lot of complication to a game that might not have needed it. But people think that this is a very sudden insertion, that the Whispers are a new element to the universe of Final Fantasy VII. And this isn't true. It's actually just an idea that has been elaborated on from the first Final Fantasy VII game. And since then, the idea of the Whispers has been slowly evolving in front of us throughout the remake. Notable examples, here we can see in Final Fantasy VII, Hephalna and Gas talk about the cries of the planet alluring the Sephra about the calamity of the skies. We have seen this mentioned in Final Fantasy VII a lot. The voices of the planet are nothing new. But we see the idea of the cries of the planet change into something much more interesting in Dirge, where in a very early cutscene of the game, Reeve and Vincent hear them, but we don't see them. As the wind sounds like a thousand wailing storms. Listen, can you hear them? The cries. The wailing of a thousand souls we can see echoed in the Sephiroth scene at the end of the game. Listen. Thank you. 
thousand years ago, the arrival of Genova. Genova appears right before the new cycle begins, near the end of 2000. In the calendar, Genova is imprisoned sometime later, and not long after that, the start of the new era begins at zero. Fast forwarding right before this new calendar resets, in the year 1970, almost 2,000 years after Genova's arrival and her imprisonment, we see that Genova is rediscovered. What happens after this? In year one of a new calendar, 2,000 years after Genova was imprisoned, Sephora finds Genova and is thrown into the life stream. This moment, unlike the Wu-Tai War, is extremely significant, as it is the start of the second coming of Genova. We know that through the events of the original Final Fantasy VII that the events play out just as they did before. Sephiroth is stopped, a meteor strikes the Earth, and a virus spreads through Geostigma and AC. This, too, has already happened before, 2,000 years ago. Paul Nutt talks about it in the original Final Fantasy VII. After the calamity of the skies, Genova began to infect people with a virus, and the few remaining Sephiroth that are left imprison her. What this virus most likely is, is Geostigma. Apollo mentioned that the virus killed countless Cetra. What does that mean to us? If Geostigma and the virus are one and the same, because of Genova and Sephiroth's relationship, we can assume that it has the same effects. Sephiroth and AC uses the souls infected with Geostigma in the life stream to corrode and corrupt it. And by accomplishing this, he can gain control over it and use the planet's life stream to infect the larger life stream. So if Genova had already infected souls 2,000 years ago with her virus as well, planet has already had infected souls like this in the life stream from the very beginning of this cycle. And that Sephiroth is doing the same thing that Genova already did 2,000 years ago, since the very beginning. So what is the takeaway from all of this? The calendar proves to us events have been set to repeat themselves from the very beginning. The 2,000 years signifies the arrival, the defeat, and the rebirth of Genova. This is proven not only by the evidence presented in part one, but it's also proven to us through the events of 2,000 years ago, all the way up to Dirge of Cerberus. So if Geostigma has been present on the planet for all this time, then how has everything not completely crumbled and fallen apart? How has the life stream been able to maintain a balance since the start of this cycle? Dirge of Cerberus, Chaos, and the proto materia The proto materia otherwise known as the First materia controls the entities of both Omega and Chaos, one representing the life stream and one representing Genova. I have a lot to say about Dirge of Cerberus and the level of impact that this game has in ways that are completely crazy, but the proto materia is important to talk about because it has a large role in explaining how Gaia has been able to survive all this time, even with the presence of Geostigma prior to the events of Advent Children. In order to understand the materia, we are going to have to look over the elements that the proto-materia is directly associated with. The first element being chaos. This character has a presence since Final Fantasy VII, but is elaborated more upon with information from Dirge of Cerberus. Here's a brief history of Dirge of Cerberus. Grimoire, Vincent's father, acquires a tablet written by the Cetra, beginning his research into Omega and Chaos. The tablet reads, Soul Rot of Terra Corrupt, calling in purity, purging the stream to beckon forth the ultimate fate, the old mighty chaos, Omega Squire to the lofty heavens. The tablet leads to Grimoire to finding a specific cave, as we will come to understand it as Lucretia's cave. A cave that has some pretty serious implications. In this cave, we find a pool, which is contaminated. This contaminated pool that Lucrezia and Grimoire assume that chaos is to be born from. This is elaborated on by the Omega Report in Dirty of Cerberus. The doctor believes that the crystalline spring contains contaminated deposits of bioplasma that have overflowed from the pure life stream. In fact, all of our readings indicate a strange type of energy radiating from the site. Could Scordo be the location where the legendary chaos is destined to be born? This contaminated spring is said to bring about chaos, a being that the Cetric tablet refers to as a soul rod of terror corrupt. This corruption that is being mentioned here in the tablet is the same thing that we have seen time and time again. Geostigma, otherwise known as the presence of Genova and Sephiroth's influence, and that the reason for this pool's existence is because the life stream is expelling corruption of Genova. 
This is further elaborated on, as this is not the only pool that we see of this kind. This contaminated pool resembles a lot of qualities that we see presented in Advent Children. In this scene from Advent Children, Kadaj influences the children he has rounded up from the village of Edge to drink from this pool. They become puppets of Kadaj, and I proxy Sephiroth and Genova. But notice that in this scene, the pool isn't contaminated until Kadaj steps in. Straighten it. some of this out. The power of Genova and Sephiroth to contaminate the pool, thus giving those who drink it a closer resemblance to Sephiroth. Rufus actually sees something similar to what we see depicted in Advent Children. Rufus, after giving up his will to live and losing all hope as he is most likely going to drown, sees in the water a black string moving through the water. This strand slithers into Rufus's body through his ears, infecting him with geostigma. So let's dive into this. Most likely, the pool that is created in Lucrezia's cave is created after the arrival of Genova. The implication of this pool in Lucrezia's cave are that the planet is able to filter out, expel, or at least separate the contamination on its own in some way by itself, and that this contamination is most likely created by Genova's first spread of geostigma, as the cave is like this before the events of the original Final Fantasy VII take place. And that this also implies that there is a connection between Chaos and Genova, as Chaos is born from Genova's influence through this pool. To further make the connection between Genova and Chaos, we need to look at Dirge and Remake. In the scene in Dirge, Grimoire and Lucrezia have taken a sample of Chaos. The sample bursts out of the containment unit and kills Grimoire simply through touching him. But notice the trail that Chaos leaves on the ground. It's nearly identical to the effects of Genova's blood on the ground in the remake. So from this evidence, I feel comfortable saying this pool, its contamination, and Chaos are born from Genova. What is very odd about this is that Chaos himself is born from this pool, but that's not the only thing that comes from it. And now for something really crazy. The proto-materia and Chaos are found in the same pool underwater. The proto-materia is known to us by its name as being the first materia. We also know how old it is because of the proto-materia section in the Omega Report. I have determined the materia found by Dr. Valentine at the Fountain of Chaos to be a type of refined antimatter formed within the Gordo over the past several millennia. I believe the planet created this instrument out of necessity as a means to control chaos and prolong its own inevitable fate. There's a lot to unpack here, but let's just start with this. Why was it created in the first place? From what I can gather, this one material is most likely the reason that the sector were able to contain Genova in the first place. We can also further expand on this idea by looking at the weapons, as they were born from the planet, but not actually used to fight Genova. At the point in time that the weapons were created, they were no longer needed, so they were put away for further use later. So how do you think, without the weapons, the Sector were able to stop Genova? We know that the virus that Genova was spreading was killing massive amounts of life on the planet 2,000 years ago, and that instead of the Sector killing Genova, she was imprisoned underneath the Earth. That means that the Sector must have had some understanding that they couldn't just kill her, as she had already infected the live stream with spirits from Geostigma, meaning that no matter what, Genova had a way to come back. Similar to Sephiroth, it's practically impossible to fully eliminate her from both the physical world and the life stream. So upon realizing that, the Cetra could not destroy Genova. The Cetra and the planet knew that they needed to control her instead. And in desperation, the planet created this materia in order to do so. To control what she represents. Chaos. To control the uncontrollable. So what does this mean? Not only was the proto-materia the tool that gave the Cetra the control over Genova to some capacity, it was the tool that the life stream itself created to create. Oh yeah, I forgot to I adjust my camera. Sorry about that, guys. That the live stream to mitigate the damage How are we looking? A million times better, right? A million times better. All I had to do was just throw a little more rendering into it.
chaos can be directly controlled by the protomateria as long as it is present within the vessel that contains it or somebody is using it. We see Lucrezia activate the protomateria in a flashback, stopping chaos from acting up. And we see Vincent controlling chaos through the protomateria in order to keep control. So what happens to the protomateria? The protomateria is actually extracted from the pool. With the protomateria taken out of the cave, the planet was no longer able to protect itself. This could be the very reason that Sephiroth was able to infect the life stream in the years after Ancient Advent Children and Dirge of Cerberus. This could also be the reason why Sephiroth was even able to stay in the life stream after the events of Final Fantasy VII. This is directly referenced in the tablet. I believe the planet created this instrument out of necessity as a means to control chaos and prolong its inevitable fate. By controlling chaos, the planet also succeeds in preventing the advent. Are you shitting me? Note that the function that is being quoted here as preventing the advent is a secondary function to the former. Not the same function. Preventing the advent was directly preventing the events of advent children. After the protomaterial was removed, the livestream had no way of acting against the corrupted souls. This perfectly sets up why exactly things are so bad for Eric in the events of All the Way to Her Smile. It's because now she is the only means that the planet has in order to stop the corruption that Sephiroth is causing in the life stream. This isn't the only thing that strengthens my previous argument. The second path refers to a purification of the life stream, and that using the corrupted souls would send pure souls to the life stream using the protomateria to dictate this. Note that it says nothing about the souls of Terra Corrupt being taken with Omega and its pure souls. Instead, the soul rot of Terra Corrupt is abandoned by the life stream, only to be left with the burden of bearing the discarded remains of a dying world. Meaning that if the planet were to ever need to actually activate Omega under the right circumstances, that it would want to leave Genova and anything associated with it, including Vincent, to rot on a dying planet. Meaning that the planet would only want Omega to leave the planet if it was not infected by Genova cells, which is not the case with Omega in Dirge which we see. Inside Omega, we can actually see the life stream is already contaminated with Sephiroth through Nero's presence, as he too is linked to Chaos and in turn connected to Genova. Who the fuck is Nero, you're probably asking? We're gonna talk about Nero when we talk about Genova. There's already way too much to talk about with just the photo material, so we'll get to that at a different part of the video. This is the exact reason that Destiny dictated Omega's destruction, as it would have meant that Sephiroth would have succeeded. The one last thing I want to touch upon with the protomateria for now is that Dirge is not the only place we see it, and shows us that its function may have a larger purpose than just the events of Dirge. We actually see it in the original Final Fantasy VII. There's a depiction of what the protomateria used to look like. We can see that the first depiction was this light yellow orb. And we see that somewhere super important in Final Fantasy VII. At the end, to be specific, the Thomas is out of the Whoops. army and he appears to be going through the life stream. We see it as Cloud appears at the end of the first tunnel, an area covered in darkness with small lights illuminating and the strands of the life stream. But right in front of us is the same exact thing that is depicted in the concept art. So was the proto-materia supposed to be this thing? Just its original design? I think so. The strange part of the scene is that above what seems to be the original design of the proto-materia looks like water, as if we have seemingly found ourselves underwater. And what's interesting is that it actually helps guide Cloud to find Sephiroth in order to restore the balance of the world. Note that we don't see the proto-materia in the rendition of the scene in Remake. Instead, we are just taken directly to Sephiroth. I think that the implication of this is that Sephiroth in Remake is the one in control of where Cloud ends up, not the balance of Destiny, as we know from Part 1 that the balance is destroyed at this particular point in the game. The difference between the scene in Final Fantasy VII and Remake is that you are given the help to find Sephiroth by Aerith first, which is why her theme plays in the tunnel. With her help, she brings us to where the portal material and the balance reside. The protomateria then brings you to Sephiroth. In the original Final Fantasy VII, Sephiroth is trying to escape, but in Remake, Sephiroth wants you to find him. This is so that Sephiroth can try and coax Cloud to his side, also to 
depicted in the concept art are these hands holding the proto-materia. We've actually seen this imagery before when we look at Minerva's statue in Crisis Core. We're going to be elaborating on this idea more when we get to talking about Minerva. Also note that after you defeat Sephiroth, you get a hand reaching down to grab clouds, which is extremely similar to an image that we have seen countless times in the compilation in one form or another. But there is one other version of this scene that we haven't talked about, and we're going to get to that in the next session. So what is the takeaway here? What have we learned so far? What we know is that time is a set repetition, the whispers dictate this time, and that the proto-materia most likely was the reason that Genova was able to be contained by the Cetra at the beginning, and then again in the life stream, to some capacity and that the proto-materia has a greater connection to maintaining the balance beyond its first use, and that this allowed the planet to survive the first infection of Geostigma. And because of the proto-materia's absence in the life stream, most likely could have been the reason why Geostigma became such a more relevant problem in the future timeline of Final Fantasy VII. In Advent Children, Rufus gave us the lesson that the life stream created this balance. No matter how bad things get with Sephiroth and Genova, they are destined to lose. Again, the cycle is repeated on a larger scale, as we saw with the calendar, and on a smaller scale, with Sephiroth's defeat, as we have talked about in previous parts of this video. So how does this find its way into everything that we have already learned? We learn that from Loveless that there is a goddess that represents the balance of both good and evil depicted in the wings that she has. Wings of light and wings of dark. We also know that from Loveless that there are set archetypes that are created within the text that dictate the detail of the balance of good and evil. And perhaps after all of this is said and done, we can put together the pieces of what might be missing in the page of Loveless and what the implications of it could mean Loveless. The thing about Loveless is, is that I cannot, cannot just talk about the whole thing yet, because it requires a lot of understanding overall of how things work in the Final Fantasy VII universe. So we're going to take it one step at a time. But to get started, I think that from the research that I have done, Loveless is something that depicts the same cycle that we have seen represented in the calendar, but presents even more detail as to how this destiny and the cycle is dictated. I noted that in my last video that the page of Loveless was actually missing. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I there we go. Page of yeah, this one looks more like a finished piece. Loveless is destined to repeat itself the same way that the calendar does, the same way that events do throughout the Final Fantasy VII timeline. And I think that this cycle See, resets... Looking at where we were to where we are. Pieces, See the difference? I know it's a shitty recording of a screen but you can see the difference i woke up and and saw this and i was like uh-uh this ain't done this is a little more done all right let's move on to the next one man i got a little bit of time so i'm just going to uh just start it it'll probably just i'll probably just stop it at the uh, pencil sketch stage the bullet point version of this game for the sake of time is shinra and the turks are fighting against avalanche there is a spy inside of shinra feeding information to avalanche and the turks are instructed to locate the bug the bug ends up being rufus note that in the mission where you find rufus and expose him as the bug takes place in corral and that there's actually a really important reason for this, and I'm just going to go over it uh, quickly, that the importance of Rufus being here in Avalanche is because of the reactor in Corral. This is the first implementation of the technology that could extract Mako, and it is stated in the original FF7 Ultimania that Corral is destroyed specifically by Shinra because they don't want any of their competitors to find the real secrets as to how they extract Mako from the Earth. So Rufus and right. Oh shit, you know what? I forgot that I made some coffee. Of course I did. Give me a second. I apologize. But let me leave all these on the screen for your viewing pleasure. All of their information, all of their knowledge is all due to the vice president's son funding and feeding Avalanche this information. Rufus is captured 
and brought in by the Turks to their secret hideout, but instead the peasant decides not to get rid of Rufus. Instead, he is confined. So rather than President Shinra upon discovery of his son being the bug and feeding Avalanche this information, and being one of the main reasons that they have been any trouble to begin with, President Shinra does not get rid of his son. This is odd, as oftentimes anyone who is linked to Shinra's going-ons or is meddling with their plans on any level is usually killed. Gas being a really good example of this, a Shinra defected scientist who was killed because he just knew too much. And this is the same situation with Rufus. Instead, President Shinra tells the Turks that this information is to be kept between the three people there, himself, Rufus, and the Turks. Now, you think that that's where the story ends, right? And that this is done because President Shinra has some feelings for his son, and while this is kind of true, there is respect that President Shinra has for his son. But this isn't the entire reason for it. President Shinra knows exactly what Rufus is doing from the beginning. In Rufus's holding chamber, Rufus is given everything that he needs in order to oversee the events going on in the war crisis. This statement is followed by an explanation that the president himself oversaw that Rufus's holding chamber could be accommodating enough. And by accommodating, President Shinra means giving Rufus a computer with advanced enough technology so that he can do exactly what he was doing before he was put inside the holding chamber. And that was to dictate and oversee the events of Avalanche and Shinra's conflict. Rufus's intentions of working with Avalanche are presented to us as being the means of overthrowing his father, having attempted to actually murder him several times throughout the war crisis. But knowing this, President Shinra still allows him to continue to sit as the successor to the throne of his entire empire and do exactly what he was doing before his imprisonment. The only reason behind this that I can find is because there is something to be gained from this conflict. An enemy, President Shinra knows that the conflict that Avalanche creates isn't a negative, but actually to his benefit. Perhaps even more so than meets the eye. And maybe they need yourself that this is an isolated event, and that those are just the events of before crisis. So what about the rest of the compilation and beyond that? Shinra, mainly the president's bloodline, has graduated every single war that has ever taken place that we know of in the entire compilation. The Wutai War started over Shinra's attempt to extract Mako from Wutai and then retaliating. The end of the Wutai War is overseen by the president's son, Lazar. And during the last battle against Wutai, Genesis's army shows up, beginning yet another conflict for Shinra and its inhabitants, just as one is ending. And as we come to find out, the Genesis War is directly associated with Lazar himself. We come to find out that the Genesis army is actually funded directly by Lazar, using Shinra money in order to fund Gillian, the man responsible for not only Genesis' birth, but Genesis' army. Lazar eventually defects from Shinra, saying in a final email to the company that refers to both Rufus and Shinra, soldier members, I thank you for your daily hard work. Shinra's rapid growth has given birth to distortions in many parts of the world. They are Shinra's shadows. Dark entities that the president and the vice president must confront. That in turn may define them as victims of Shinra's shadows. We will talk about this in a moment. In the room, we see the exact same thing happening. Shinra is trying to make Avalanche into a public enemy. Alright, I'm back. Got my coffee, refilled my water. And I'm gonna get started on this drawing. Working on the next one. Oh shit. Hold on. Copyright claim. What is this? Telling you, man, these these dang copyright claims. It's like, yeah, I've talked about it before. Screw it. Let's just start drawing, right? Once again, starting to stir conflict. 
They perpetuate this by blowing up their reactors to fit in line with their plans of abandoning Midgar and finding the Promised Land, which in turn allows them to build Neo Midgar. This turns to the events of Final Fantasy VII, in which the Shinra army is now positioned to stop the destruction of the planet, but after the events of Final Fantasy VII, they still continue to act the same way as they always have done. In Dirt of Cerberus, there is the next war, the battle between Deep Ground and the World Regenesis Program, or otherwise known as the WRO. Deep Ground is a group of soldiers that is created by a section of Shinra that is overseen specifically by the President himself. Who do you think created the World Regenesis Program in Dirt of Cerberus? I can give you a guess. It is stated throughout the game of Dirt of Cerberus that the WRO is led by Reeves, but that the WRO is actually funded by a secret benefactor. A secret benefactor that the developers refer to as somebody of having a personal gain in its development, rather than just a way to protect the planet. This secret benefactor is Rufus. What's really crazy, and I didn't write this in my script, but What's really crazy is that because of the implication of the first scene in Dirge of Cerberus, it wasn't put into place by the events of Dirge of Cerberus, it was put into place before Meteor Fall, which is crazy. So do we see a pattern yet? Every war has been started and facilitated on both sides by the same group, the bloodline of Shinra. Its function, similar to the one that we have already talked about with the Whispers and the Calendar, fills another archetype. Shinra's actions fill the archetype of the war and beast in Loveless. Whether or not this is something consciously done or not by Shinra, these series of repeating events doesn't seem coincidental. Rather, they perpetuate the cycle. I personally think that there's evidence to support that they are doing it consciously, but we're going to get to that in a different part of the video. And also keep in mind that the planet is allowing for these things to take place. The planet isn't stopping Shinra from committing these acts but rather they are completely necessary. But why? Shinra is a pawn in a bigger game that the planet itself is playing with destiny. And we're gonna see this connection in the next section. From the last video, we can already see that Gaia functions for its own needs. As long as things play out the way that the planet needs to, it doesn't care. We see this function reflected in the way that the weapons act. We're gonna see it in the way that Minerva acts. We see it reflected in the events that take place during Dirge, not only for those who are infected with geostigma and how they do not cause the need for the planet to protect itself, but by the destruction of Omega itself. And we are seeing a direct correlation between the way that the planet acts and the way that Shinra acts. And honestly, President Shinra kind of encapsulates the idea that all sides have a similar way of acting. Is your understanding a single word of what I told you? I know what I want, and I take it. I take advantage of whatever I can, and discard that which I cannot. There is no room for sentiment or guilt. Barrett has a similar speech. Y'all gotta look at the bigger picture here. Nothing worth fighting for was ever won without sacrifice. The only difference here is what their goal is, but the means to get there are the same, no matter what the cost is, they are going to try and get to their goal. Both of these characters are willing to do whatever it takes in order to get what they want. We are going to cover some information that is important to understanding this mindset. Act 2. Water ripples across the water surface. Water is known to the people living on Gaia as a sign of the life stream. Areas that are lower to the earth and are closer to the life stream oftentimes see healing properties of the water surface. Areas like Medeal, which are offspring found out of the surface. The same area where Cloud and Tifa fall into a pit into the life stream. In Wutai, the god they worship is actually the god of water. Their other deity is the Sun and Leviathan, a water serpent. Two spiritual connections to water in one place. I can't find any other place to mention this, but I'm just going to mention it now. Is the reason why Leviathan doesn't show up in this VR cutscene, and probably wondering why, is the fact that uh, it's directly associated with Wutai and they probably don't want to show that off in their exposition of their VR segment. We also see this inside a cave in Final Fantasy VII. Note that the area here is filled with crystals that are similar to the ones that we've been discussing being a part of the cave in the VR segment of Remake, and then also in Crisis Core with Minerva's cave. We also know, based on the placement of the flowers and adamant children, that the water sits below the surface of the flowers, and also presents healing properties. And the apples that grow in Benora 
Brian Price's corner have something to do with the North Underground, where the water most likely gives the land the light in order for these apples associated with the life stream and Minerva to grow. We know that these two places, Eric's Church and the Benora Underground, are most likely places of worship, or at least places that have a connection to the life stream. We see this echoed in the flashback with the ancients in Final Fantasy VII Remake, that this is also depicted as having the same property. The water is flowing and the life stream is present. So water seems to be connected to the Cetra and the life stream, but that's not the entire story here, because the water has a far greater relevance beyond this. Eric and the water. Eric herself represents the water, and the developers told us it was. Let me explain. Eric's area in Final Fantasy VII Remake features its own clear water. Midgar already known to be a place without this kind of flourishing life. They need water filters to drink any sort of water that might be accessible. But what about the spiritual side, the spiritual representation of water? We see this in Advent Children when Cloud is summoned to talk to Aerith. We see flowers represented here as well. We see it later in Advent Children when Aerith speaks to Cloud before the fight with Kadash. Through the water, we see Marlene feel Aerith's presence through the water in Advent Children. We see water and a flower communicate to Marlene to bridge a connection between space to let her feel Barrett's presence, and Barrett feels hers. Notably in Crisis Core, Zack's death, we see Eric do the same thing too, Eric looking up into the sky, noticing or feeling Zack. Zack is shown looking into the rain as a direct parallel to the connection being made. In the remake, this is most likely the reason as to how Eric is able to sense Zack as well. As the water begins to fall, Zack and Cloud from a different timeline appear. Also note that the end credits roll on it raining within a dark space. Where have we seen a dark space and water before, I wonder. But where things get actually crazy is in the scene. What on earth is this place? This place is talked about by Crisis Core developers. The blue sky symbolizes Zack, the white feather, Angel, and the water, Eric, the water which reflects and envelops the blue sky symbolizes Eric. From the interpretation that when Eric hears the voice of the planet, she is accessing the life stream, we have the image of Eric's consciousness traveling through the water, which is reminiscent of the life stream, or it is a symbol of the life stream itself, something like the planet's will. By showing the connection between these three elements, it hints at the story as a whole. To break that down, when Eric hears the voice of the planet, she is accessing the life stream to do so, and that this access is through nature. This is known to us as planet reading, something that Eric's mother, Alma, tries her best to explain to Professor Gax in the original game as an ability to have a conversation with the planet, but it's much more than that. The implications are that water, and as we already know, flowers, are a way that Cetra can access this conversation to the life stream. It is also a way that they can communicate or interact with other places. And as we see from Remake, different times. We're going to get back to that quote, especially pertaining to Loveless and the Wings. All of this is super important for the rest of the discussion, but we'll get into it. But this gives us complete confirmation that Aaron is connected to water, and that the water is not just a minor character, it actually is giving us the of what we need to know in order to deconstruct Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, and through that, remake in the compilation. It is important to note this isn't the only place where we see large stretching space of water. We see it in Advent Children, and we see it in Remake. You don't see it plain as day, but Cloud lands in it in Advent Children as he's coming to talk to Aerith. We see it in Remake, but in Remake something happens to upset the scene. Just as a direct parallel that this scene has with the quote that we just read about the blue water reflecting the blue sky, definitely has some serious implications as to what's going on in this scene in Remake, especially since the water is literally blown away. I think that this is some interesting foreshadowing going on here. That's definitely something that we're going to get to talking about when we talk about Genova. If you think we're done with water, you're absolutely wrong. We've got a lot to talk about with that, as the water is depicted in Loveless. But now, we need to talk about another element to the bigger picture. The flower. 
flowers. We know that flowers have played a large part in Final Fantasy VII in general, but their function is only starting to show up more in Remake. These flowers are usually put into contacts with Eric, just like the water, but flowers are not only the key clues hidden throughout the entirety of Final Fantasy VII Remake and the compilation, it has massive implications as to where we are going to end up in the sequel to Remake. Here we go. I mentioned while covering Minerva in the last video that in Benora the apples grow, and that I mentioned that the apples themselves are significant because they give us a direct link to the qualities that Aerith shares throughout the remake, and because she is connected to Aerith, that she is a Cetra just like Aerith. They're one and the same. But then something came up. Thanks to Ramagus, I hope I'm saying that right, but Ramagus pointed this out to me. Before apples become apples, they are flowers first. This is not obvious to me, and I'm dumb, but let's just stay focused here. So, are there flowers that are linked to the Nora apples? How would we know that they are connected? Well, the color purple is associated with the apple. So, what I guess we should be looking for is a purple flower. Maybe one specifically related to the events of Christ before the Nora. And if so, are the purple throughout the entirety of Final Fantasy VII stories. And I came to find out, yes, there are purple flowers, they are in Crisis Core, in Venora, and that that's not the only place that they are found. They are found in Remake, and their placement is extremely significant to giving us some information we desperately need to know. So, in Crisis Core, we are shown a purple flower singing the boss of Angel's mother's house. We see a withered one, through a keyhole in Shimmer Manor and Crisis Core, but in Remake, they appear in one particular spot that is of note, the Cetra VR cutscene. A life stream passes the group, and the life stream flies over the ground. Purple flowers start to grow. No, it is not a variety of flowers, it is specifically purple. Yes, there are parrots flowers there too, but they're not grown from the life stream. We see this at the end of the segment of this scene too, just to show us this effect again. It's done so in order to make it clear to us that this is extremely important. Also note that the trees in Venora follow a path. We know that the live stream flows underneath Venora, and in the VR segment, the live stream passes and trees grow as well. This most likely is the thing that creates the path of trees in Venora. You think that this is it for the color purple, especially with the color purple as regards to flowers. Well, we see flowers having a time to share specifically both Rufus and the President directly. The first one comes from the President Exhibition Hall, where President Shinra is depicted shaking hands with Mayor Domino. The President is actually wearing the colored purple flower on his suit. Note that Mayor Domino has a number of different colors, but the one that they decided to specifically give President Shinra was the purple one. This scene, this moment, what we are seeing with Shinra and this purple flower directly parallels the scene that Eric and Cloud are in in the beginning of the game. Eric pins a yellow flower to Cloud's shirt. The fact that the purple flowers are tied to another Cetra, Minerva, and that the yellow is tied to Eric as a Cetra is not a coincidence. This is setting up for a massive event, one that we are going to be talking about in detail when we talk about Minerva and Genova. And this is not the only reference to Shimmer that these flowers make. Rufus is playing with these coins, weapons that are made specifically for him for combat. On the back of the coin, we see a guard dog depicted with flowers below it. This link with Shimmer is not a coincidence and actually just opened the door for this entire conversation. This is something that we have to talk about now. So as I'm filming this part of the video, I looked at Twitter and Audrey, who has been posting all about the Ultimania, she brought up the coin and that it's mentioned in the Ultimania and that they're purple. I was so afraid that this coin, just because it was gray, that I wouldn't be able to make the connection to the purple flower, but it it's confirmed. 100% confirmed. This flower, the same purple flower, is the same one we have been talking about. It is the Mandagoria flower. This flower represents, it represents fear. This is Buffy 
fucking crazy, and it actually just kind of explains everything that we're going to be talking about with the flowers. The function of the flower, their association with Shinra, and the Setra, and the fact that we have seen them throughout the games tell us that Shinra and the Setra have been operating under the same logic as one another the entire time. I am going to make the call right now, and I'm saying this in this video right now, that Shinra and Setra are both working together in some way. And I think that this is directly tied to Minerva, and we're going to explain that, but it has everything to do with this purple flower connection. And we're going to be talking about Minerva later in the video, but we really need to get to one character that I already sort of said that I was going to talk about in the last video. We're going to be talking about Rufus. I'm going to say it, Rufus is, in some way, linked to the planet. There's something very strange about Rufus from the very start of his introduction. The fact that he does nothing different from the original game. Nothing new and nothing strange. And that is what makes it strange. And strange for one reason. He can see the whispers. He notices them in a scene that has zero effect on the events of Destiny. He is just walking. He isn't disrupting time. The ghosts aren't even remotely concerned with what he is doing. They're just kind of around. We can further explain this through the remake Ultimania, that the ghosts are only swarming over Midgar as a precautionary action to the events that are about to take place with Sephiroth, meaning with absolute certainty he isn't doing a thing. So how is he able to see the whispers? The only thing new here is that Rufus, without being touched by Aerith or interacting with the timeline, has gained the sight. So has he had it all along? Realize that Rufus, up until this point in time, has not been in Midgar. He only just arrived. Meaning that Rufus himself has not had any experience with the Whispers and would not have until this point in time in Remake. The Whispers have only recently appeared in Midgar and only recently appeared in this large of a number to be noticed. And because of his recent arrival, could not have had any contact with Eric. I think that Rufus only concerns himself with seeing the whispers until the fight is over with Cloud. And when he realizes that he is the only one who can see them, the obvious reaction here is what he gives. Something starts to unsettle him, but that's not the way we see him afterwards. Something that concerns me about the last scene with Rufus is that instead of seeming unsettled, more importantly, he seems very dissatisfied. Something is wrong. From reading about Rufus, you have to understand that he is groomed to lead. He is a very methodical character and very rebellious. He plans everything out before it happens in extreme detail and executes this idea. In that, he applies most of these skills, both physically and mentally, to directly overthrowing his father. So everything that Rufus has wanted up until this point in time, he has finally gotten. He is the president, and his father is dead. Rufus has been getting off on this happening since before crisis. All these things, all the things he's ever wanted, are now realized. But I think that Rufus is trying to figure out exactly what the implications of the whispers are, and more specifically, that the reason for him seeing this is linked to his father, and this leaves a bad taste in his mouth. This is the reason why he's dissatisfied when he sits in the chair. The moment he has probably wanted is of his father's death. He touches the chair and sits down. It doesn't look like he feels like he is acquiring the power, but that the seat is still his father's. His father is still in control somehow, and he isn't sure how. His father, even in death, has gotten the best of him. So taking all of this into consideration, what is happening Rufus is doing nothing. And instead, what is unsettling Rufus is a secret. Somehow, his father outplayed him. I'm going to just say it, and I'm gonna, and I'm just making an observation, and I don't want anybody to be mad, but the only way anyone is able to see the whispers without contact is by being Sephiroth. I know that Sephiroth can see the whispers, 
So you might assume that it has some connection in some way to him, but Cloud has S cells in him and is only able to see the whispers when Eric touches him. I know that there's a theory that because of his infection with geostigma in admin children, because of that, he might be able to see them. I don't think that this is the case either. Cloud in admin children was also inflicted with geostigma. Both of them are cured by the end of admin children. Again, Cloud is only able to see the whispers after Eric touches him, regardless of his connection to geostigma. So really, the only indicator left here is that Rufus has Cetra blood in him. It just seems to be the only possibility from my understanding. And through the process of elimination, some things that could support this, the coin that represents the connection between Shinra and the Cetra, as we've already discussed, this could also be how the war... Sorry, I just wanted to do that. It's been bugging me. <laughs> President Shinra creates and perpetuates the war... Let, let's move forward with uh, shading this, this one. The, flowers. the second thing being Rufus's mother. Since we have zero knowledge of who she is, there is just the massive possibility that she could be Cetra. We have never seen her depicted, and we only have what's said about her in the novel of On the Way to a Smile. And that Rufus's mother was someone that Rufus and President Shinra think of fondly. To understand how the president thinks, and his past flings and his children from them, most of his children and his relationships with these women are either completely distanced from ever knowing about President Shinra's existence or completely abandoned. Um, that's reflected also in The Kids Are All Right with the, uh, the main character's mother. He's also a son of Shinra. Lazard was created the same way. So obviously there is something about their relationship with Rufus's mother and both Shinra and Rufus that they both must have mutually. They must have both cared about her enough equally to be able to understand that of one another. Rufus's very first episode <clears throat> he enters to leave a safe room designed by his father is to enter his mother's birthday. It ends up being his birthday, but the fact that the first thing Rufus can conjure up as being something that his father cared about the most, being his mother's birthday, says a lot. The last thing I will say is that Ultimania gave us Rufus's age, which for some reason was changed from 24 to 30. If you were to be born of Cetra blood, it would most likely be a Falma that would be his mother, Eric's mother. And seeing the time zone between Alfana's time at Shinra, Rufus's birth, Alfana's escape from Shinra with gas, and Eric's birth all would work out time frame-wise. It would be possible. We also know that Alfana has been with Shinra for some time before Gas meets her, which is extremely odd because we don't really have a clear picture as to why she's there or in what capacity. The only thing we know is that she was at Shinra when Gas met her and that when Gas left the company, he took Alfana with her. The likelihood of him being a genetic experiment is no longer an option now because of his age. As Genova was discovered after Rufus's birth, it can also very easily be the case that it was someone other than Alfana, somebody that we haven't seen before. I'm just quoting all sides that I can think of. Another thing that makes this a likelihood is the way that Rufus is treated in the fourth crisis by the president, is that instead of it being out of respect that he spares his son, it could be the case that President Shinra sees his son more as an asset than he does a son. If Rufus's blood is Cetra, this could also be the reason why no matter what Rufus does, no matter how much he hates his father, no matter how many times he's tried to kill him, no matter how much he wants his father dead, Shinra will always end up giving Rufus the seat of power in order to perpetuate the same cycle in the War of Beasts that we've already talked about. And since there seems to be a correlation between the Cetra and Shinra, specifically with the purple flower, this just strengthens that idea. Whether there is a conscious link between the Cetra and Shinra, the point of the War of Beasts is still made and fills its role. And the comparison between Shinra and the Cetra is still made by the representation of flowers, which we will come to understand later in the video. And also uh, note that this isn't the Cetra that I was alluding to at the beginning, and we're going to be talking about them at the end of the video. One thing that might be on your mind as we're leaving this section is we know that the 
characteristics of these flowers might fit into the same context as one another. But then why are they colored differently? It seems obvious that regardless of their color, they both serve the same function. They are created by the live stream and manifested through the same presence of Cetra and in holy areas. And that is true from what I've found, except for one massive reason. The main difference is who they were associated with. Winds of light and dark spread afar. And Jill, Genesis, and Sephiroth. This part is going to give us a very clear picture as to what exactly the balance of good and evil really looks like in the context of the Final Fantasy VII universe. Someone pointed out to me in the comments that Angeal is not a Cetra, and actually was born from Genova cells, just like Genesis was. And that was my mistake, and it ended up being a very happy mistake, because this really got me thinking about how exactly Final Fantasy VII defines certain colors. Genesis, Angeal, and Sephiroth are all associated same birthplace. They all come from Genova, but why on earth does Angeal have a different name depicted? I can understand them being on two different sides of the shoulder, like Genesis and Sephiroth, but a different color completely? One that is associated with good, even though Angeal was born from something that is clearly evil? In this quote, we get to see developers' mindset as to why the colors are selected. The wing which Genesis has on his left shoulder in this game, and which Sephiroth has on his right shoulder in FF7 and AC, as a children. The mechanism behind sprouting the wings remains unexplained. According to the development staff, the wings were made black based on the notion of good and evil. So answer this question for me then. Why is Angeal not only depicted with the white wing, but why is he represented resembling all the traits as a Cetra? Genesis is not the only one who likes reading, and Geo does too. Reading the emails from their fan clubs in Crisis Core, we discover this. They would read, Famous Gardens Monthly, a magazine of various flora published by Shinra. Now isn't that just noble? Nature-loving man we all know and love. And Geo is associated with flowers. Are you fucking kidding me? To seal the deal, Angel is depicted in a scene that we discussed earlier, the one that shows Zack on the pool of water. Later on, what do we see? A scene of Zack being grabbed onto by a hand, notably Angel's. The way this scene plays out is exactly the same way that every other Cetra in the entire population are depicted. So why on earth is Angel being depicted doing the same thing? This is the reason. The reason that he is depicted as Cetra is because, all things considered, he actually is. Not physically born as such, from what we know, but embodying the same ideals of that of someone like Eric. Unlike the others in his group, Angel doesn't care about power. He cares about people, and apparently flowers. The only reason that he is a conflicted character is because he cares about people. This is what causes his suffering. Just as Sephiroth and Genesis got their wings from what they represent spiritually, Angeal does the same thing with his wing. This has some very serious implications, but I think that going back to the developer's comments on Zack's scene are going to clear things up for us. Even though he succeeded Angeal's will, Zack finds himself not only unable to help anyone, but also can find him in evil heart, and is wracked by a sense of despair and powerlessness. And Jill gets him back on track, and Zack decides to rise up from it again. This decision is represented by the mental image at the start of Chapter 9. This theme in Final Fantasy VII, powerlessness and defeat, that Zack is experiencing in this scene is something that has been elaborated on pretty extensively in the subject of Geostigma. The reason that Geostigma infects only certain people is because of their mindset. Those who embrace that and accept it and have lost hope of living are the prime targets of Geostigma. It feeds off of powerlessness. Rufus is afflicted with Geostigma because of this exact reason in On the Way to a Smile. Because he gives up and accepts what does Aerith, etc., and the cure for Jewish stigma all have in common? Well, their themes is that they represent hope, life, salvation, all this other cool 
friendship. And Jim gives Zach that hope back and actually has a hand in him, not only getting out of Nibelheim, but also is the one to greet him upon his death. So if this section didn't already make this 100% clear, let me just say this. There is hardly a difference between the entities of Genova and the Lifestream. They all have the same power. There is hardly a difference between Eric and Sephiroth. They also have the same power between Avalanche and Shinra. What they try to achieve is different, but their mentality of how they get there is the same between Angel and the Sephiroth, or Purple Flowers, or Yellow Flowers. There isn't a difference. The difference is not their power, not where they come from, but what they represent. The line that Final Fantasy VII is painting through Angel is the choices that you make. The white feather, <sighs> as well as being the symbol for Let's Angel, that. is also the symbol for wings. The wings which cross the blue sky is Angel, and it also includes the hint that in order to reach those heights, dreams, he needs to overcome many difficulties. Let's talk about that last one. Because for me, it encompasses the entire scope of what we're going to be experiencing. Remake is all about the concept of what it actually takes to change the world. What is it going to take to make the right choice? Not to take the path that Destiny has repeated because it worked, but the hard choice. And what comes of that? What are the ramifications? What are you willing to lose? No matter the odds, are you going to try and do what's right? Up until this point in the Final Fantasy VII timeline, it didn't matter what you chose, or what side you were on, or what dreams you had, because Destiny was literally structured to dictate things for itself. There really wasn't a choice whether you liked it or not, until Remake. Remake, as implied in the title, is about remaking the future. Remaking the structure, defying it, in fact, which is the real reason that Zack lives at the end. So many people have been caught up in what is his timeline, how does this work, what does this mean in terms of where he is in time, but it's not really supposed to be about that. Yeah, that's important, but that's not the, the, the defying thing about it. It's not about focusing on the time travel. It's to show you that a character who defined himself by a code of honor, and that this code meant nothing other than to fulfill a purpose for something bigger than himself, whether he liked it or not. And no matter what kind of person he was, and we know that he was good, he was always destined to just die outside of Midgar. But now, that's no longer the case. Did you ever notice that in the scene right before and after we see Zack, we zoom into two different characters' minds. We zoom in at Clouds to start the scene, and we zoom out of Eris. These characters, and how they have functioned before Remake, were very much defined in a lot of ways by what Zack represented. And that is still true. But now, Remake is framing it in a different context. The game is lining up for Aerith and Cloud to reflect what Zack represents in Remake. Now, having lived, Zack is able to continue to pursue his dreams without anything holding him back. He now has the actual freedom to embrace his dreams. Damn, man. And then the end of Yuffie's, the end of Intergrade, wow. This is a long time coming and a lot to talk about, but something that I wanted to address that no one seems to be talking about is what exactly is Aerith doing for us, the party, in Final Fantasy VII Remake? She is giving us a choice, a real choice. A choice to actually save people, not to condemn them to a system that is only using them for its own personal gain. She is saving them from a lifetime of servitude to the planet for it to perpetuate a status quo that kills countless lives. In order to understand the scope of Aerith's impact, you have to understand Aerith and how she's depicted in The Maiden Who Travels the Planet, and how she is depicted in Remake. She is just as weird, but is a confident, very sure, very self-sacrificing, very dedicated individual to her friends, but 
also the planet. She is aware that at some point, her life will come to an end to save the planet. In the maiden who travels the planet, she is very aware that her death is coming, and she's prepared for it. She even knew about the world that etc. would reach in the end once they had fulfilled the mission they had on the planet. That was why she accepted death fearlessly. Even when she had a strong feeling it was going to happen to her someday soon, she fulfilled her mission as she meant to. Without any fear, her heart was at peace. She had no regrets, such as wishing she was still alive. This Aerith is fearless. The only reason she has any misgivings about what she's doing is because it upsets Cloud. But she knows what she did was what she was supposed to do. She knows her job to help the planet, and by helping the planet, she was doing what was best to help her friends. That is not the era that we see in the remake. She is scared, unsure, hesitant, and very wary. Not when it comes to helping her friends. When it comes to helping her friends, she has no trouble. But when she starts talking about the planet, her destiny, this becomes very troubling for her to speak about. Because she isn't sure what to do. And why do you think that is? Let me be clear. Aerith is sure that she can do something about what is happening in Remake. She knows that she can alter destiny. What she isn't sure about is whether or not to change it. We know that from the events of the timeline that things are not exactly lined up to be beneficial for the souls on the planet. Unlike the Aerith from the original game, or the book, she did not seem to have this amount of foresight. The difference between Remake Aerith and the original Aerith is that Remake Aerith has the foresight, and that this sight comes into view through the whispers themselves. I mentioned in the previous video that Eric actually didn't know what the whispers were upon their arrival in the story, and the only reason they even make an appearance in Remake is because Sephiroth disrupts the timeline, which causes the ghost to appear, and she doesn't know about the whispers at first. What we do know is that she figures out what they are later, and she has started seeing things more clearly in the bigger scope of things. Over time, Eric starts to figure out exactly where the path she is on leads, and she starts to see that everything that has happened, all of the tragedy, was actually orchestrated by the planet, a cycle perpetuated by anger and hate. And now that she knows, the whispers are actually trying to stop her from remembering the future. The whispers through touch can actually make people forget. Eric mentions that pieces of her feel like they are being taken away every time the whispers come near her. What they are trying to do is that they are trying to suppress Eric's memories. There are other examples of this in Remake. Hojo almost spoils Cloud, that he isn't a soldier like he thought he was, and we see him whisked away. The next time we see him, he is dazed and confused, and he never brings up the whispers or brings up the subject of time again. We see the same thing happen in the deep ground incident with Barrett and Tifa. Barrett tries to shake off the daze that he's been put in after being whisked away himself, unable to grasp exactly what was happening. Cloud is no longer able to recall what he was thinking about which is why he isn't having another episode like the moment before, and gets distracted by a cat. They don't dwell on it, they don't ask why Cloud was acting strange, because they had forgotten. But Aerith, she doesn't forget, and the more she starts to figure out, the more unsure she becomes. Because the Aerith that we learn to know from the events of the Maiden who traveled the planet, and on the way to a smile, things become clearer to Aerith as far as what she is personally capable of, and what the balance of the planet looks like. My theory is, is that there is a future of Aerith, or at least the presence of her knowledge, and that this is directly accessible to Aerith in Remake, and most likely through the whisper she is able to get in touch with us. And that Aerith is not just scared of what might happen by following the destiny that the planet has set out for her, and though she cares about it. But the real fear is how much control she actually has over the situation, and that none of her friends really have the same say over this as she does. Think about it. Aerith can't tell them the full scope of the decision that 
they are making if she tries to explain to them in Shinra HQ because the whispers stop her. So regardless of how supportive her friends are, the decision is really only hers to make because she's the only one who is capable of knowing the entire story. The only thing that she can do is tell certain characters a certain amount of information. Nothing that can alter time in the present events, i.e. Red 13 and Marlene. None of the party possesses the connection that Eric has, so they can't possibly understand the scope of the decision they are supporting when they decide to help Eric. Throughout the game, she starts to realize that all of her friends' lives and the course that they take are now up for her to decide, and that unlike her friends, she can make the only real choice that anyone is able to make. To understand Eric, you need to understand exactly how much power she truly possesses. For example, why was Eric able to use the life stream to protect the planet from the beginning after Holy Fields? The planet was meeting its demise, letting it empower everyone. Eric cried out, the waves of thoughts expanded through the Sea of Mako, carried by the life stream. It spread throughout the planet. I can't do this alone. Let's all protect the planet. The cry of the last Sephra shook the countless consciousnesses that she had awakened during her journey. The entire planet's consciousness was awakened. Of course, among them were also the consciousness of those that were suspended from their atonements. With their strong wills combined together, they managed to control the enormous energy of the planet. This ability to communicate directly to spirits of the life stream is very significant as it shows us that Eric has a lot of sway over the will of the planet, something that I haven't discussed in depth. The planet itself can dictate direction, but the finer details of how this is done is mainly guided by the Cetra. As an example, the planet isn't aware of exactly why Eric needs to be in the life stream, but it knows that she needs to be there, as noted from the maiden who traveled the planet. It makes sense. There's meaning to all of this. There must be some reason why I haven't merged with the life stream yet. Like, how was I the only one in the world who had the material to call holy? There might still be something I have left to do. Just when the thought crossed her mind, she felt a little commotion from the planet. It wasn't from the individual consciousnesses, but the planet as a whole, as if to confirm what she was thinking. I see. I wonder what it is. Her question was answered with silence. The planet, too, had yet to know what it was. In order to protect the planet, the spirits need to be guided specifically to protect itself from meteor. We actually see her try and use this ability to communicate to the planet in the whispers. The most notable one from Raymate is the dream sequence with Cloud and Eric. I thought it was going to be when she tries to talk to the flowers. Just this, but it's usually the scene that gets brought up the most because people see it as a direct reference yeah. to when she's killed. But that's not exactly what's going on. But in Remake, this isn't the first time she does this. She does this before the plate collapses. Note that Eric does it before the specters show up to stop the party. And as they fly away to go get Biggs and Wedge and Jesse, she does it again. Actually makes a remark about this, but it isn't elaborated on. The reason she's doing this here is because she is trying to use her ability over the specters in order to communicate with them and hopefully stop them. The reason this isn't working as it did before is because the group of whispers is being led once again by the enigmatic specter, one that Sephiroth controls. This means that anytime we see Aerith praying, she is doing it for some reason. So here's the question then. Why does Eric pray during the dream sequence? Eric and the dream sequence. There's a lot of people who think that this is a dead Eric. People have already pointed out that she seems to be talking about things that, uh, that haven't happened, but there's a lot more to the scene than just her knowledge because we know that Eric already has this knowledge throughout the game. Uh, so to me, the fact that she is foreshadowing things that haven't happened yet isn't really definitive enough for me to call her the future era, but there are some things to point out. The one thing that supports this is the presence of the life stream in the scene. Its presence is significant as it's noted in the maiden who travels the planet that the presence of the life stream makes up the afterlife 
in the book and it is visible to those who are in it. The presence of the live stream here signifies that this just isn't a regular connection that Eric is making. I'm going to be honest with you though, this makes talking about the implications of the scene difficult. And I'm going to explain why. Because in Adam and Children, this is not how the dead Eric communicates to Cloud. She does it in this white space, a space that in Remake is framed differently than the others in the compilation. As Cloud is having his moment with his memories in the Church of Remake, there isn't any confusion about this scene, because it's the same scene that happens in the original Final Fantasy VII. A scene where Cloud is confronting his memories. Sephiroth's presence here is cleared up as an illusion by the Ultimania, so that confirms that. This is just setting up Cloud dealing with his identity issues. So then what exactly is happening here becomes a bit muddled. There isn't any clear indicator as to whether she is dead or isn't. The only thing I can think of through reading The Maiden Who Travels the Planet is that a dead Eric is not able to touch Cloud in any way. The only thing she can do from the afterlife is to attempt to guide those who are living's consciousness while they are present in the life stream. Which is noted that when Tifa falls in with Cloud in the deal, Eric tries to do this for Tifa and is successful. So that sort of confirms her being dead, as I can't imagine why she can't touch Cloud in the dream sequence. Another thing that supports this is that Cloud and Eric never really touch each other in Advent Children. The only time they do is when Cloud is dying, and he is sent back to his body through her touch. So the implication of this scene is pretty much what people already expected, which is fine and all, but the implications of Eric praying is the thing that stands out. And if you want to know my opinion, I think she's using a white materia, but for something else that we haven't seen her use it for. Let me explain. I think Eric is using the materia to create the portal at the end of the game. Things that explain this, you don't see this magic at any other point in the game. There is no indication of Eric being able to use this magic so suddenly because she actually set it up by praying for it in the dream sequence. How Eric is able to use the materia is described in the book. In order for her to use it, she must not hesitate in what she is praying for. If there is any hesitation, her voice will not be... Alright, man. And I'm gonna... Call an end to this one. We, you know, we hit 90 minutes as a decent stream. Uh, we touched up this one from the other day. Uh, touched up this one just for like a second, which is cool. And then we got a little bit of a pencil sketch in. I'd say, you know, we got a little, got a little bit of everything going going on in this stream. So it, it was, I like it. <laughs> um, so yeah, man, I'll uh, I'll see you guys next time. I'm G Mr. Drew. That's at G Mr. Drew on all social media. You can follow, like, and subscribe. And you know, those links are in my bio along with my website you can check that out and you can contact me through there any and all support is appreciated uh if you like what you see you want me to do any sort of character portraits for you or anything like that i'm on fiverr as well as patreon and um and you know you can check out my patreon and and see what sort of uh deals and offers i have there there's a whole bunch of them and they all pertain to character portraits and things like that so you know, I work in digital and traditional, so you just let me know what you want, man, and and I'll do it. And so, yeah, other than that, I want to thank every single one of you for watching the Andrew Gloszewski Experience, episode 184, doing some character concept art, and yeah, man, i really enjoying this series. I created all these references myself, and, you know, so now illustrating from my own references is really bringing something out of my art that I think otherwise wouldn't be there. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, super cool. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you. Love you. Peace.